The Chesapeake Bay's top predator and valuable economic resource is declining at alarming rates. For the sake of the fishermen who need them for their livelihoods, and for the rest of the ecosystem, can blue crabs survive into the future? Ecologically, blue crabs are important because they regulate the food web structure of, of the bay. So the general health and ecological sustainability of the, of the bay's food web is determined in large part by blue crabs. Everything's connected, so if we lost the crabs, we would probably lose a lot of other species that are related in the food web to the crabs. Well, it's very important for us. I mean, very important. It sustains for a lot of people. You know, this is, this is what they do. I mean, it's not for fun, it's to make money. To understand how many blue crabs can be caught for the fishery to be sustained, it's necessary to know the overall population numbers. Understanding the blue crab population is done in part through trawling, attaching a net to the end of the boat, and then pulling it up to see what creatures are inside. Hey, Mike. Yeah, Rob. What side are we doing? We're going to go out to the Mouth Mud site. We're taking the boat out uh, on the Road River to one of our long-term trawling stations, and we'll be launching the net pretty soon. Scientists note the size, sex, age, molt stage and any lost legs of each crab found. 156, mature female. See? Intact. Male. G0, missing L1 and L4. This is a mature female blue crab. You can tell by it has a large, rounded, dark, dark abdomen. So this is one of the key uh, life stages that we're trying to understand because these are the females that produce the eggs. Also important to understanding population levels is measuring how many of the young crabs survive to adulthood. Many of the young crabs are eaten by mature crabs, naturally keeping the population at healthy levels. And what we found in our long-term study is the population of blue crabs seems to drive the mortality rate of juvenile blue crabs. So if there's a lot of adult blue crabs, you're going to have a high mortality of juvenile blue crabs. To test the rate of mortality from young crabs, the team tethers them in the water and comes back 24 hours later to see how many have survived. So I've got a spike, a crab, and a float. Put it in the sediment, let the crab go. Crab can move two meters, bring the float up, and it's there for me to check tomorrow. We'll come back the next day after 24 hours and look to see uh, what the survival rate is. Uh, we'll know that if it's alive, dead, or if it's been preyed upon it and has some missing limbs. Many dangers threaten the survival of blue crabs. For younger crabs, the biggest worry is how to escape being eaten by adult crabs. But by far the largest threat to the population is overfishing. The major impact on blue crabs is through fishing. When I first came here almost 35 years ago, uh, blue crabs were abundant, but starting in 1990 or so, population went through a very severe decline. One of the biggest problems was overfishing of adult females. After mating, a mature female crab has to make a long journey to the lower Chesapeake Bay before she can lay her eggs. But on the course of that journey, many of those crabs have been caught before they could spawn. One of the things that we've shown is that the fishery has been disproportionately impacting female crabs uh, in key places, particularly the reproductive stock in the lower Chesapeake Bay. Female blue crabs mate only once in their lives, usually in a higher tributary of the bay, such as the Road River. In the fall, they begin to migrate to spawning grounds, where the water is salty enough for their eggs to grow. Well, the females, they've got a long way to travel and a lot of hurdles to get over when they're going from a river where they're mating down the whole bay to the mouth and that it takes a lot of effort on their part and then they're encountering a lot of fishermen in the process so they're the odds are against them to even get down to the spawning grounds. Scientists at CERC have been tracking that journey to see where exactly the female crabs go and how many of them are left in the bay. This female got here about a year ago she's getting ready to migrate back down the bay to produce eggs. So we're understanding how these females move around in the system and um, 
what they're doing here on a daily basis and then also on a life cycle basis. Tracking the females is done through tagging. Attached to the back of a blue crab is a pink label with a CERC phone number. When watermen find them, they call with their location. This lets the team know about the timing of the crab's journeys and the routes they take. So when crabbers catch them, they can call us and tell us where they were, when they caught the crab, and who they are, how they caught it. You turn it into CERC, you mail the number of the tag into them, you give them the location, you give them the date, when you caught it, and the idea is just to, supposedly to help the crab population out, and make determinations how many are being caught. The watermen in this area have been very cooperative with us and uh, very, we've been very successful at working closely with the watermen and depend on them for our data. The team can also track the journey of a female blue crab through the chemistry of its shell. We take the carapace off the back part of the crab and then we'll take a section out of it. And then we'll dry it, we grind it up, we treat it a couple different ways. The remains of the shell are analyzed for chemical signatures. There are more than 30 trace elements in the Chesapeake, elements like mercury and cadmium. Every nursery has a different chemical signature. When a female crab goes through her final molt, the hypothesis is that the chemical signature of that nursery should remain on her shell. The hope is that we can take crabs from the spawning sanctuary and compare them back to the samples we took in the rivers and match them up, see where they came from. And that can affect the fishery because if we find that a lot of the population of crabs is coming from one river, then maybe we need to change our practices a little bit to support that river. So one of the big changes that's occurred effectively in fishery management that's improved things and allowed the population to recover has been changes in fishing that have prohibited fishing of blue crabs in the spawning sanctuary in the main stem, the high salinity zone of the bay where females are releasing eggs. So that's allowed the population to increase its reproductive capacity and has led to uh, a recovering blue crab population beginning in 2008 for the last two or three seasons, so that the population is now up to about 50% of what it was back in the 1980s. Restrictions on commercial fishing have recently been enacted to give crabs a chance to complete their journeys and continue breeding. Do I want more regulations on us? No, not really. Honestly, I don't. But then again, I'd like to have a crab population too. I think we should do what it takes to sustain a good population. Since the drastic drop in the 1990s, the blue crab population has started to come back. But it's a fragile recovery. The team at CERC still does not know if these numbers are part of a trend or just an abnormality in the big picture. We've seen a very fast recovery and we can see a very fast decline. So it takes eternal vigilance, which is why we're continuously monitoring the population on a monthly basis, year after year, to track those fluctuations and understand what's going on. 